Outlook, the absolute imperative. Quoting Galatians 6.11 See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Who is allowed to say it? You must change your life. The voice Rilke heard speaking to him at the Louvre has meanwhile left its point of origin. Within a century it has become part of the general zeitgeist. In fact it has become the last content of all the communications whirring about the globe. At present there is no information in the world, ether, that cannot be connected to this absolute imperative in its deep structure. It is the call that can never be neutralised into mere statement of fact. It is the imperative whose effects are unhindered by any indicatives. It articulates the motto that arranges the innumerable chaotic particles of information into concise moral form. It expresses concern for the whole. It cannot be denied. The only fact of universal ethical significance in the current world is the diffusely and ubiquitously growing realisation that things cannot continue in this way. Once again, we have reason to recall Nietzsche. It was he who first understood in which mode the ethical imperative must be conveyed in modern times. It speaks to us in the form of a command that sets up an unconditional overtaxing. In so doing, he opposed the pragmatic consensus that one can only demand of people what they are capable of achieving in the status quo. Nietzsche set the original axiom of the practicing life against it, in the form established since the eruption of ethical difference into conventional life forms. Humans can only advance as long as they follow the impossible. The moderate decrees, the reasonable prescriptions, the daily requirements, in all cases their fulfilment presupposes a hyperbolic tension that stems from an unrealizable and inescapable demand. What is the human being, if not an animal of which too much is demanded? Only those who set up the first commandment can subsequently present ten commandments in the first. The impossible itself speaks to me. Thou shalt have no other standards next to me. Whoever has not been seized by the oversized does not belong to the species of Homo sapiens. The first hunter in the savannah was already a member. He raised his head and understood that the horizon is not a protective boundary, but rather the gate for the gods and the dangers to enter. In order to articulate the current overtaxing in keeping with the state of the world, Nietzsche took the risk of presenting the public with a book for everyone and nobody. A prophetic eruption, 6,000 feet beyond mankind and time, spoken with no consideration for any listeners and yet allied in an invasive fashion with each individual's knowledge of his intimate design for the not yet. One cannot simply let the Ubermensch program rest if one knows that it stands for vertical tension in general. Its proclamation became necessary once there was no longer sufficient faith in the hypothesis of God to guarantee the anchoring of upwards pulling tension in a transcendent pole. But even without God or the Ubermensch, it is sufficient to note that every individual, even the most successful, the most creative, and the most generous must, if they examine themselves in earnest, admit that they have become less than their potential of being would have required, except for those moments in which they could say that they fulfilled their duty to be a good animal. As average uber-animals, tickled by ambitions and haunted by excessive symbols, Humans fall short of what is demanded of them, even when they wear the winner's jersey or the cardinal's robe. The statement, you must change your life, provides the basic form for the call to everyone and nobody. Although it is unmistakably directed at a particular addressee, it speaks to all others too. 
Whoever hears the call without defences will experience the sublime in a personally addressed form. The sublime is that which, by calling to mind the overwhelming, shows the observer the possibility of their engulfment by the oversized, which, however, is suspended until further notice. The sublime, whose tip points to me is as personal as death and as unfathomable as the world. For Rilke, it was the Dionysian dimension of art that spoke to him from the disfigured statue of Apollo, and gave him the feeling of encountering something infinitely superior. Today, on the other hand, the authoritative voice can scarcely be heard in works of art, nor do the established religions or church councils possess any commanding authority, let alone the councils of wise men, assuming one can still use this phrase without irony. The only authority that is still in a position to say, you must change your life, is the global crisis, which, as everyone has been noticing for some time, has begun to send out its apostles. Its authority is real because it is based on something unimaginable, of which it is the harbinger, the global catastrophe. One need not be religiously musical to understand why the great catastrophe had to become the goddess of the century. As it possesses the aura of the monstrous, it bears the primary traits that were previously ascribed to the transcendent powers. It remains concealed, but makes itself known in signs. It is on the way, yet already authentically present in its portents. It reveals itself to individual intelligences in penetrating visions, yet also surpasses human understanding. It takes certain individuals into its service and makes profits of them. Its delegates turn to the people around them in its name, but are fended off, by, fended off as nuisances by most. On the whole, its fate is much like that of the god of monotheism when he entered the stage scarcely 3,000 years ago. His mere message was already too great for this world and only the few were prepared to begin a different life for his sake. In both cases, however, the refusal of the many increases the tension affecting the human collective. Since the global catastrophe began its partial unveiling, a new manifestation of the absolute imperative has come into the world, one that directs itself at everyone and nobody in the form of a sharp admonition. Change your life. Otherwise, its complete disclosure will demonstrate to you sooner or later that you fail to do what you fail to do during the time of portents. Against this background, we can explain the origin of the unease in today's ethical debate, both in academic and in its publicistic varieties. It stems from the discrepancy between the monstrosities that have been in the air since the Cold War era after 1945 and the paralysing harmlessness of all current discourses, whether their arguments draw on the ethics of attitude, responsibility, discourse or situations, to say nothing of the helpless reanimation of doctrines of value and virtue, nor is the off-sided return of quote-unquote religion much more than the symptom of an unease that awaits its resolution in a lucid formulation. In reality, ethics can only be based on the experience of the sublime, today as much as since the beginning of the developments that led to the first ethical secessions. Driven by its call, the human race of two speeds began its campaign through the ages. Only the sublime is capable of setting up the overtaxing that enables humans to head for the impossible. What people called, quote-unquote, religion, was only ever significant as a vehicle of the absolute imperative in its different place and time-based variations. The rest is the chatter, of which Wittgenstein rightly said it should be brought to an end. For the theologically interested, this means that the one God and the catastrophe have more in common than was previously registered. Not least their trouble with humans, who cannot rouse themselves to believe in either. There is not only what Coleridge called the quote-unquote willing suspension of disbelief, 
in the fiction whose absence would render aesthetic behaviour impossible. An even more effective approach is the willing suspension of belief in the real, whose absence would prevent any practical accommodation with the given situation. Individuals barely ever cope with reality without an additional element of derealization. Incredulous derealization, furthermore, makes little distinction between the past and the future, whether the catastrophe is a past one, from which one should have learned, or an imminent one that could be averted by the right measures. The reluctance to believe always knows how to arrange things in such a way as to achieve the desired degree of derealization. Who can hear it? When it comes to man-made catastrophes, the 20th century was the most instructive period in world history. It demonstrated the greater disaster complexes came about in the form of projects that were meant to gain control of the course of history from a single centre of action. They were the most advanced manifestations of what philosophers, following Aristotle and Marx, called, quote-unquote, praxis. In contemporary pronouncements, the great projects were described as manifestations of the final battle for world domination. Nothing happened to the humans of the Age of Praxis except what they or their fellow humans had instigated. Hence one could say, there is nothing in hell that has not previously appeared in programs. The sorcerer's apprentices of planetary design were forced to learn that the unpredictable is an entire dimension ahead of any strategic calculus. A small wonder, then, if those good intentions did not recognise themselves in the bad results. The rest was in line with psychological probability. The militant world improvers withdrew from their self-induced debacles and attributed whatever was too much for them to disastrous fate. The most convincing interpretation of this behavioural pattern was penned by one sceptical philosopher, after fatal undertakings, the failed protagonists indulge in, quote unquote, the art of not having been the one. Analogous patterns are at work in the run up to the announced catastrophe. Before fatal developments, the actors on the political stage demonstrate the art of not having understood the signs of the times. Western people have long been well rehearsed in this behaviour. One could call it universal procrastination, through deep-seated cultural practices. Ever since the Enlightenment demoted God to a moral background radiation in the cosmos, or declared him an outright fiction, the moderns have shifted the experience of the sublime from ethics to aesthetics. In accordance with the rules of the mass culture existing since the early 19th century, they internalise the belief that one survives merely imagined horrors completely unharmed. In their eyes, shipwrecks only ever occur for the viewers, the disasters only so that they can enjoy the pleasant feeling of having escaped. They conclude from this that all threats are simply part of the entertainment, and warnings an element of the show. The return of the sublime in the shape of an ethical imperative that is not to be taken lightly catches the Western world, to leave aside all others, unawares. Its citizens have become accustomed to viewing all indications of imminent disaster presented in the tone of reality as a form of documentary horror genre, and its intellectuals are doing justice to their reputation as detached cosmopolitan spectators by deconstructing even the most serious warnings as a discursive genre and portraying their authors as busybodies. But even if it were not an aesthetic genre, they would remain pragmatic in the belief that they could take their time taking the information seriously. Furthermore, surely someone who wished to take the signs on the horizon personally would immediately collapse under such worries. Nonetheless, these contemporaries will ascertain sooner or later that there is no human right to non-overtaxing, any more than there is a right to encounter only such problems as one can overcome with on-board resources. 
It is a misunderstanding of the nature of the problematic if one only puts such matters in that category as have a prospect of being solved during the current term of office. And it shows an even greater misjudgment of the nature of vertical tensions in human existence if one assumes a symmetry between challenge and response. Overtaxing on one side, surpluses on the other, and no guarantee that the two go together like a problem and its solution. Who will do it? Whatever is undertaken in the future to confront the dangers identified, it is subject to the law of increasing improbability that dominates our overheated evolution. We can deduce from this observation why the socially conservative propaganda circulating between Rome, Washington and Fulda does not provide any suitable answer to the current world crisis. Aside from possible constructive effects in smaller circles, for how should timeless quote-unquote values, which have already proved powerless and inadequate in the face of comparatively small problems, suddenly gain the necessary power to bring about a turn for the better when confronted with greater difficulties? If the answer to the current challenges were genuinely to be found in the classic virtues, it would be sufficient to follow the maxim formulated by Goethe in his Divan poem, the bequest of the ancient Persian faith. Solemn duty's daily observation, more than this, it needs no revelation. Even if one is willing to admit that this, beneath the oriental mask, is the greatest utterance of the European bourgeoisie before its historic failure, it is clear that we cannot be helped merely by a rule of preservation. Next to the indispensable concern for taking established traditions with us, after all, what impresses us most is the novelty of situations that demands bold answers. Even in Goethe's Weimar home, there would be more talk today of solemn duties, daily invention, before doing away with the objective. Solemn. Adjective, quote-unquote, solemn. Firstly, because it goes against the taste of the time, and secondly, because something that is invented daily is not suitable for a solemn sense of duty. After further reflection, one would also remove the preceding noun and speak of tasks rather than duty. Finally, one would issue a statement with the impenetrable suggestion that the well-intentioned people in the harmonious society find a fruitful way of recombining the old and the new. If one studies the instructions from Rome, one will note that they consist of equally inscrutable formulas. The law of increasing improbability opens up the perspective of two overtaxings in one. What is happening on the earth at this moment is, on the one side, an actual integration disaster in progress, that of globalisation, launched by Columbus's voyage in 1492, set moving by the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire in 1521, accelerated by wood world trade between the 17th and 19th centuries, and driven along to the point of an effective synchronisation of world events, thanks to the quick media of the 20th century. These synchronised the previously scattered factions of humanity, what we call cultures, into an unstable collective, torn by inequalities at a high level of transaction and collision. On the other side, a disintegration disaster is in progress, heading for a crash whose time is uncertain, but which cannot be delayed indefinitely. Of these two monstrosities, the second is far more probable, as it is located on the line of processes that are already underway. It is furthered above all by the conditions of production and consumption in the world's wealthy regions and developing zones, insofar as they are based on a blind over-exploitation of finite resources. The reason of nations still extends no further than preserving jobs on the Titanic. The crash solution is also probable because it offers a large psycho-economic price advantage. It would save us from the chronic tensions affecting us as a result of global evolution. Only happy minds experience the piling up of Mount Improbable to the heights of an operatively integrated world, quote-unquote, society, as a project that vitalizes its participants. 
those with less cheerful natures have the impression that being in the world has never been so tiring. Well, what then could be more logical than the principle of mass culture? Making entertainment the top priority, and accepting that, as far as everything else is concerned, things will happen as they must. It was the philosopher Hans Jonas who proved that the Owl of Minerva does not always begin its flight at twilight. Through his remoulding of the categorical imperative into an ecological one, he demonstrated the possibility of a forward-looking philosophy for our times. Quote, Act in such a way that the effects of your actions can be reconciled with the permanence of true human life on earth. End quote. Thus the metanoetic imperative for our present, which raises the categorical to the absolute, takes on sufficiently distinct contours for the present. It makes the harsh demand of embracing the monstrosity of the universal in its concretized form. It demands of us a permanent stay in the overtaxing field of enormous improbabilities. Because it addresses everyone personally, I must relate its appeal to myself as if I were its only addressee. It demands that I act as if I could immediately know what I must achieve as soon as I consider myself an agent in the network of networks. At every moment I am to estimate the effects of my actions on the ecology of the global society. It even seems that I am expected to make a fool of myself by identifying myself as a member of a 7 billion person people, although my own nation is already too much for me. I am meant to stand my ground as a citizen of the world, even if I barely know my neighbours and neglect my friends. Though most of my new national comrades remain unreachable for me, because quote-unquote mankind is neither a valid address nor a thing that can be encountered, I nonetheless have the mission of taking its real presence into consideration at every operation of my own. I am to develop into a fake year of coexistence with everyone and everything, and reduce my footprint in the environment to the trail of a feather. The situation of overtaxing is fulfilled by these mandates as much as by the old European imitatio Christi, or the Indian moksha ideal. As there is no escaping this demand except by fleeing into narcosis, one faces the question of whether one describes a sensible motif with whose aid the gulf between the sublime imperatives and the practical experience, practical exercise can be bridged. Such a motif, if one leaves aside the phantoms of abstract universalism, can only be gained from a consideration of general immunology. Immune systems are embodied or institutionalized expectations of injury and damage based on the distinction between the own and the foreign. While biological immunity applies to the level of the individual organism, the two social immune systems concern the supraorganismic, that is to say the cooperative, transactional, convivial dimensions of human existence. The solidaristic system guarantees legal security, provision for existence and feelings of kinship beyond one's own family. The symbolic system provides security of worldview, compensation for the certainty of death, and cross-generational constancy of norms. At this level too, the definition applies that life is the success phase of an immune system. Like biological immune systems, the solidaristic and symbolic systems can also pass through phases of weakness, even near failure. These express themselves as in human self-experience and world experience as an instability of value consciousness and an uncertainty as to the resilience of our solidarities. Their collapse is tantamount to collective death. The strong hallmark of systems of this type is that they no longer define their the own in terms of organismic egotism, but rather place themselves in the service of an ethnic or multi-ethnic, institutionally and intergenerationally expanded self-concept. 
This enables us to understand why evolutionary approaches to an animal like altruism, which manifest themselves in the natural readiness for species to procreate and care for one's brood, develop among humans into cultural altruisms. The rationale for this development lies in the magnification of the own. What seems altruistic from the individual's perspective is actually egotism at the level of the larger unit. To the extent that individuals learn to act as agents of their local culture, they serve the wider own by making concessions in the narrower own. This implicit immunological calculus forms the basis of sacrifices and taxes, manners and services, asceticisms and virtuosities. All substantial cultural phenomena are part of the competitions between supra-biological immunitary units. This reflection necessitates an expansion of the concept of immunity. As soon as one is dealing with life forms in which the zoon politicon man participates, one must reckon with the primacy of supra-individual immunity alliances. Under such conditions, individual immunity is only possible as co-immunity. All social organisations in history, from the primal hordes to the world empires, can, from a systemic perspective, be explained as structures of co-immunity. One finds, however, that the distribution of concrete immune advantages in large layered quote-unquote societies has always shown considerable inequalities. The inequality of access to immune chances is already felt early on as the deepest manifestation of quote-unquote injustice. It was either externalised as an obscure fate, or internalised as a consequence of dark guilt. During the last millennia, such feelings could only be balanced out through supra-ethnic mental practice systems, vulgo the higher quote-unquote religions. Through sublime imperatives and abstract universalizations of salvific promise, they kept the paths to equal symbolic immune opportunities open for all. The current state of the world is characterised by the absence of an efficient co-immunity structure for the members of the global society. At the highest level, quote-unquote solidarity is still an empty word. Here then, as now, here, then as now, the dictum of a controversial constitutional law theorist applies, quote, whoever says humanity seeks to deceive, end quote. Well, the reason for this is plain to see. The effect of co-immunitary units, today as in ancient times, are formatted tribally, nationally, and imperially, and recently also in regional strategic alliances, and function, assuming they do, according to the respective formats of their own foreign difference. Now, readers note, own hyphen foreign, as in the difference between those two, according to the respective formats of the own foreign difference. Successful survival alliances, therefore, are particular for the time being. In keeping with the nature of things, even world religions cannot be more than large-scale provincialisms. Even quote-unquote world is an ideological term in this context, as it hypostasizes the macro-egotism of the West and other major powers, and does not describe the concrete co-immunitary structure of all survival candidates on the global stage. The subsystems still exist in mutual rivalry, following a logic that repeatedly turns the immune gains of some into the immune losses of others. Humanity does not constitute a superorganism, as some systems theorists prematurely claim. It is, for the time being, no more than an aggregate of higher-level quote-unquote organisms, which are by no means already integrated into an operational unity of the highest order. All history is the history of immune system battles. It is identical to the history of printing protectionism and externalization. Protection always refers to a local self and externalization to an anonymous environment 
for which no one takes responsibility. This history spans the period of human evolution in which the victories of the own could only be brought with the defeat of the foreign. It was dominated by the holy egotisms of nations and enterprises, because quote-unquote global society has reached its limit, however, and shown once and for all that the earth, with its fragile atmospheric and biospheric systems, is the limited shared site of human operations. The praxis of externalization comes up against an absolute boundary. From there on, a protectionism of the whole becomes the directive of immunitary reason. Global immunitary reason is one step higher than all those things that its anticipations and philosophical idealism and religious monotheism were capable of attaining. For this reason, general immunology is the legitimate successor of metaphysics and the real theory of quote-unquote religions. It demands that one transcend all previous distinctions between own and foreign. Thus the classical distinctions of friend and foe collapse. Whoever continues along the line of previous separations between the own and the foreign produces immune losses, not only for others, but also for themselves. The history of the own that is grasped on too small a scale, and the foreign that is treated too badly, reaches an end at the moment when a global co-immunity structure is born, with a respectful inclusion of individual cultures, particular interests and local solidarities. This structure would take on planetary dimensions at the moment when the Earth, spanned by networks and built over by foams, was conceived as the own and the previously dominant exploitative excess as the foreign. With this turn, the concretely universal would become operational. The helpless whole is transformed into a unity capable of being protected. A romanticism of brotherliness is replaced by a cooperative logic. Humanity becomes a political concept. Its members are no longer travellers on the ship of fools that is abstract universalism but workers on the consistently concrete and discrete project of a global immune system. Although communism was a conglomeration of a few correct ideas and many wrong ones, its reasonable part, the understanding that shared life interests of the highest order can only be realised within a horizon of universal cooperative asceticisms, will have to assert itself anew sooner or later. It presses for a macro structure of global immunizations. Co immunism. Civilization is one such structure. Its monastic rules must be drawn up now or never. They will encode the forms of anthropotechnics that befit existence in the context of all contexts. Wanting to live by them would mean making a decision to take on the good habits of shared survival in daily exercises. <laughs>